Hi there, I'm Sandy Alnock, and recently I asked on my social media, in my stories, for people to give me some questions I could answer in a vlog. So I'm going to chat about stuff today while I do some painting. So I hope you enjoy either the chatting or the painting or both. First, something that wasn't a question, but I wanted to let you know about it since it came from one of the community. Sue, one of my patrons, emailed to ask if she could donate to my World Watercolor Month fundraiser for the International Child Art Foundation. She doesn't do watercolor, and that's what's generating funds for ICAF this month. So I created a special product if you're in her situation. It's called For the Kids, and it's 10 bucks so that other people could add to our community art donation. You can, of course, go make a contribution to ICAF on their website and get a receipt for your taxes. But if you don't itemize and you want to help us reach the $1,000 goal set for this year, then please feel free to click on the link in the doobly-doo. All right, let's get to the questions. Alexandra asked, do you remember your first art experience? And I guess I have a couple answers to this. I know that I was always drawing something when I was little, coloring books and all kinds of things. I always had paper and pencil and crayons in my hand. And when I was very young, I remember drawing a ton of this little cartoon figure that I thought I invented. I don't know if I did. I still don't know. But if you picture an upside down U with vertical lines at the opening, which would now be at the bottom, big eyeballs on the body legs and feet hanging out down below, just big round feet, and then arms with little mittens on them, holding tennis rackets and school books and basketballs. I drew this little character doing so many different things. It was just a little drawing, a little doodle, and I don't think any of them survived. Mom saved all my Mother's Day and Father's Day cards and stuff in scrapbooks and a few of my drawings, but apparently I had so many that they didn't all get saved. And then she saved some of my older art from high school and college, but the rest of my work went by the wayside. But all of that didn't necessarily include the feeling that I was an artist. I just liked to doodle and draw and color. The first time that I felt like I could be one, though, was in high school. One of my teachers came to ask me if I'd like to paint a mural on a wall in the school. I had never painted anything huge, and I don't even recall actually doing much acrylic either anyway. But I do remember feeling very, very fancy that I got passes to get out of an awful lot of my classes so I could go down to the career development office to work on the mural. And I have to confess, a lot of that time I wasn't actually painting. I just got a, out of a lot of classes for months. And that was kind of nice. It was the benefit of being an artist. And I still don't recall really what was in that painting. There was a big I think there was a lake, and there was a big mountain on one side, maybe some trees. I don't know. I wish I'd taken pictures of it that I had saved. I'm sure I took pictures somewhere. All right, next question. Do you need to be able to draw in order to watercolor? You don't need to be able to draw for everything. If you're filling in a stamp, no, or if you're making a background and just splooging some color on, of course, no. Knowing some shading can help, which is related to drawing, but you can sometimes figure that out without doing real sketching. But then there are some subjects that you don't have to know how to actually draw anything in order to paint them. Like the wave that I painted in my previous video, not in today's, but in the previous one, that one only requires a sense of light and shadow and some elegance in the lines, but not really drawing per se. But for a lot of subjects, you will not have success in painting until you've worked on the underlying skills of drawing. Now, imagine something with me. If you're using someone else's drawing in a stamp, or if someone came and sat down at your desk and drew a cabin on a mountain for you to paint, then if they did that drawing well, you could probably do a fairly decent job of painting it because they've given you the, the good drawing. 
But if they got the perspective completely wrong on that cabin, and if their trees were all wonky and looked very flat and weird, the no amount of effort on your part as just someone filling it in with paint is going to fix that if you don't even know what was wrong with their drawing. And if it's your sketching skills that are really bad, then you are that bad friend who's giving you a bad drawing and setting you up for failure instead of for success. But once you have the underlying elements right, that's not when perfect painting comes out, but that's when technique work can actually begin. Learning to draw isn't the magic solution to everything, but it's gonna give your painting a good foundation and then you can start applying technique to it, but you need to get the drawing right first. I've pulled in a comment from Susan B here on YouTube, and this is not really a question, but since it's related to the previous one, I thought I would address this a bit. She appreciates the way that I model, how to grow and improve, even as an experienced artist. I'm one of the few talking about this, and it was on one of my videos when I was doing sketches to prepare for doing a painting. I might be one of the few that does this because there's a lot of artists who suffer just like we all do from imposter syndrome. Because if we let people know that we're struggling to learn how to do something or trying to unlearn old bad habits or desperately trying to learn how to handle a medium, then if we tell people about that, we might be confirming what we think everybody else is already saying about us, that we don't have a clue what we're doing. But in all honesty, most people are far too busy worrying about what other people are saying about them. They don't really care about what you're struggling with for the most part. But I know a lot of developing artists appreciate hearing that others ahead of them on the journey have similar challenges. So I do like to share those things because I hope it will help you to grow and take your next steps as an artist. There are some artists who I know talk about these things all the time, and I do appreciate them admitting that they have some challenges they're trying to overcome, and, and that makes me feel better at the stage I'm at as well. Marsha from Cozy Craft Room on Instagram posted something that wasn't really a question, but I thought I'd mention that my watercolor style has actually developed from making mistakes. See, I started adding deep, rich darks to my paintings because I had mistakes in my underlying washes to recover from. But what I've learned is that I love contrast in my watercolor, just like in every other medium that I use. I love how having really good darks next to really bright whites gives depth and life to a piece. It draws attention to a particular area. And rather than try to be all soft and pastel and romantic with my paints, like some other people do, I get to just do me. So sometimes recovering from mistakes can actually develop into your own style as well. Jill asked about the planning process. What prep work do I do? And I have to admit that sometimes the day of process is merely clearing off my drafting table and I just get to work. But even if I can leap into that finished project that morning, I have also spent countless hours, days, sometimes weeks prepping. I have huge lists of things that I want to do. And in my chill time with the pups, I often will just sit there with my phone and do research. I look for the thing that I wanted to do to see if there are tutorials on the topic or pieces on people's websites that are what I'm trying to create. And if the answer is yes, then nothing is covered. So I start looking at the rest of the things on the list and see if there's an idea somewhere else that I could add to this original idea to make it unique. Because I don't think it's worth the time to make a video on a topic if I don't have something new or different to say in that piece. It may not be better all the time, but if there's a new technique I have or an idea that I can communicate, then it gets thrown onto the calendar. And since I do weekly themes, if it's a Monday style project, one of my deep dives where I can teach beginners and intermediates something, then I look for something advanced that'll pair well with, with it for Friday's video. And if it's one of the Epic Friday projects, then I start pondering what piece 
could make a good teachable video on Monday. So I have a pair for each subject for a week. And if I don't get a pair, then I keep bumping that stuff out on the calendar list until I have a matching set. And once I have a matching set, then I'll spend some time doing a lot of practice. It's just stuff that I throw into sketchbooks. I do daily sketching every day on all different kinds of things. And often I pull from stuff that I'm going to be doing in the next couple of weeks because I have a vague idea where I'm headed at the very least. And sometimes those ideas, though, are also seeds of a class. Because if I can see there are five really good ways to do variations and people could really learn something from it to apply to all kinds of other things, it could be a mini class. If there's more than that, then it might go onto the list for a bigger 10 lesson class. So a lot of these things get bumped from YouTube to a class or even from a class. If the class doesn't work out, then it gets bumped to a YouTube project. And if I'm doing what I know I should be doing, I always would create a sketch first. And sometimes it's those daily sketches that I've done, but sometimes it's just before I work on the project itself. A small version in the same medium or a pencil or charcoal piece or whatever it might take to get to that finished art piece. I didn't do any sketches for today's painting, but I'm not sure that that would have helped me much here because there is just a lot going on in this wave. Next up is a question about how I get everything done. And I have to say, I have one answer for that. Google Sheets. I used to have an Excel spreadsheet years ago with the next two months dates listed, what project I was gonna have on each of my video days, what medium it would be, and checking off if things were done yet, if they were scheduled, and if social posts were scheduled for all of that stuff. But Google Sheets changed the whole game since I can now mess around with stuff while in my phone in the grocery store. Uh, the aforementioned list is also in a tab in my, my sheet. So if I get an aha moment, I can pop something onto the list to start working on sketches for for later. It's better if I toss everything into a sketchbook, though, rather than just writing it down on a list. But if I don't even write it out down on a list somewhere, then I am likely to lose the idea entirely. And you might have guessed that if I have spreadsheets, then that means that I work ahead. Before 2022, I worked about four to six weeks ahead because I was always aligning with product releases and that kind of stuff. But that got me so disengaged from what I'm feeling in the moment, what I'm creating right then. Because like, think about knowing that you're making a Christmas project in June that won't be posted until October is just asking for an excuse to see the therapist. Now I work maybe two weeks ahead if I'm lucky. And the Peace, Love, and Art Challenge has put me way behind on my production schedule since I've been releasing new classes every two weeks. But that is gloriously going to be coming to an end at the finish of July. So I'm going to be able to breathe again. And I'm so excited. Kim asked what Giallo and Vienna are up to. And they are just enjoying life, except when there's fireworks. Vienna is deathly afraid of even the tiniest pop in the distance. She just has a meltdown. And on the 4th of July, we had a horrendous time. She'd already spent a couple weeks shivering and crying in the bathtub, hiding in there. But World War III is just too much for her. I tried asking the neighbors that day across the street to please consider, please, please consider taking their arsenal out to the countryside where dogs were not going to be 200 yards from the line of fire. But they just laughed and they proceeded to move the location of their launch closer to my driveway in that part of the street. Well, me and the dogs, we spent that night huddled in the back of the SUV with movies on the iPad as loud as it would go, which is not very loud. But the double buffering of the car plus the garage helped with a little bit of sound muffling. But boy, was it hot in there. So I'm glad that most of the fireworks have stopped now. We just get a few bangs a day going on. Haven't people blown up all of their money yet? But otherwise, the pups are actually loving 2022 because I have committed to them. We're going to do daily walks, rain or shine. And we used to go occasionally and then we'd go to do runs in the park. But 
then I didn't get any exercise. I would just stand there and they'd go run. <laughs> and I needed to get me some exercise. So we've committed to just doing really long walks together every day. And they love going out to visit all the squirrels and the rabbits around the neighborhood. We have a good time together. So thank you all for these great questions, for sticking around. Tell me what you think of the painting. If you like this one and you need to have it, then it'll be over in my shop. There's going to be a link in the doobly-doo. Thank you so much. Hit that like button and make sure you subscribe if you have not yet already. And I will see you again in the very near future because that's what I do around here. I post more videos. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. <laughs>